Hi everyone. Um, today we're going to be reading Ahmed Aziz's Epic Year, chapters 24 and 25. Today we are doing something a little bit different. We are, I'm going to leave the video on and um, I'm also going to stop throughout the video for some discussion points and reminders um, for annotations and especially making inferences because we're going to be focusing on that this next set of chapters. So let's get started. Ahmed Aziz's Epic Year, Chapter 24. Mom and Sarah were waiting for me in the garage when I got off the bus. I knocked on the window and mom lifted her head off the steering wheel. What are you guys doing? I asked. Her eyes were both puffy and sunken in. We were waiting for you to get home to go visit dad. <clears throat> Sounds good to me, I said, opening the front door. The nurses would call it day five post-op, which means we had sat for four days at dad's bedside, enjoying the moments he'd be alert long enough to talk to us. <clears throat> we usually went after homework, but before dinner. I didn't ask mom why the schedule had changed. We allowed Sarah her monologue. Okay, so at this point, if you don't, know any of the if some of this vocabulary is unfamiliar to you like the word monologue i would mark that and make sure you have a space a reminder to put it in the space in your packet um so you can look up that word later <clears throat> and snack was later than usual because we had an assembly at school and by then the cheese had gotten really melty and gross mm -hmm, mom said and it was Max's turn to have a special reader in class, and his great-grandmother came and read us a book. She didn't look like a great-grandmother, even though I don't think she had a single hair that wasn't gray. Mm -hmm. We had a running commentary all the way to the hospital, but once we parked, Mom interrupted, turning in the seat to face her. You know how today is the day he was supposed to move out of the ICU? I hated the intensive care unit and was excited to have him move out. Walking past all the rooms with the sickest patients made me feel uncomfortable. Dad wasn't sick like that, was he? <clears throat> well, he had a little setback, so they're keeping him there. She turned to me in the back seat. They had to put him back on the ventilator. I want you to visit him, but I also want you to be prepared. Prepared how? He's not going to be able to open his eyes or look at you or talk to you. Mom put one hand on mine and one on Sarah's, but it's only temporary. They don't want his body to work so hard while he's healing. Dad had been intubated the first night after he came out of surgery, day zero post-op. But zero meant it didn't count, right? This visit wasn't a little different. It was completely different. This, we had to wear special yellow gowns and masks before we were allowed to enter to make sure he didn't catch our germs. Dad had a tube in his mouth, and with every whoosh, I saw his chest rise and then fall. There were three tall poles, like a coat stand, with different sized bags hanging from them. Some were clear, some yellow, and some so precious they were wrapped up like a baby in a blanket. Dad looked small and weak in his hospital bed, tiny under the tubes and pipes and machines. Mom's aunt once sent her a special pot from India made of terracotta. Mom was convinced it would be the solution to all her biryani-making woes. It came in a crate the size of a kitchen sink. We removed layer after layer of packaging and finally found this tiny pot in a bed of straw in this huge box. That's how Dad looked. Fragile. Okay, also an important word. If you don't know what fragile means, that should definitely be annotated um, because it's a very important descriptive word about Ahmed's father. I stood in the doorway but couldn't get myself to go in. <clears throat> I don't think they needed to worry about him catching germs. He didn't look strong enough to catch a thing. Mom pulled three chairs to his bed. I brought you a couple of visitors. Even Sarah was silent. She hesitated at the door and then took one cautious step toward him. You can come closer, honey. I'm sure he'd love to hear your voice. I can't imagine dad could hear a thing. Hi, Dad, she whispered, moving one step closer with each word. I stayed in the doorway <clears throat> where the pinging, beeping, whooshing got louder in my ears. The room spun and Mom was by my side, her arm over my shoulders as she walked me to my chair. Mom, is Dad going to be okay? I'm not sure, Ahmed. Okay, so at the end of chapter 24 on page 125, 
this would be a good place for you to make an inference about how Ahmed is feeling about his father being sick. Um, there should definitely be an annotation about that. You should pause this video and write that down as we move on. <clears throat> okay, chapter 25. Every night when mom came home, she said dad had to stay in the ICU for one more night. And most days when she got back from the hospital, Sarah was already in bed and sometimes I was too. When we did see her, she was too tired to talk. When we wanted to visit, dad needed his rest. I was hoping Sarah hadn't noticed, but she's a smart kid. Sarah sat at the table, <clears throat> finishing her plate of Tuesday night tacos in black pants and a gray t-shirt with more holes than cloth. She was dressed to match her mood. It was dad's old t-shirt, <clears throat> the one he was wearing the day they found him, and she had claimed it as her own. The first time we visited dad in the hospital, I was jealous of Sarah. She walked into a room to a dad who hardly recognized her and still sang him songs and told him about the fight with her best friend and how her favorite Jolly Rancher flavor was now watermelon and not cherry. <clears throat> I was jealous because she didn't understand how serious it was. The second visit was the same, but I noticed peeking out under her tutu, dad's beaten up gray t-shirt. Since then, whenever dad got sick, she'd wear it until he was safely back home with us. When I asked her about it, she said, well, it brought him back to us once. Today, she didn't bother to cover it up. No tutu, no sweatshirt. Come on, Sarah, let's watch videos of puppies falling asleep. <clears throat> a few years ago, using Sarah's old shoebox and the magnifying glass from my first science kit, I had created my own projector. I could make videos and photos from my phone big enough to cover a wall. On rainy days, we played photos of blue skies and sunshine and spent the day inside blissfully ignorant of the thunder and lightning. Puppies falling asleep were Sarah's favorite. She didn't bother to reply. We could watch one of those ballet videos instead, I said, searching for the most popular ballet videos, or you could show me some of your latest dance moves. I haven't seen a twirl for a while, and I realized it was true. You never wanted to see me dance before. I'm not stupid, Ahmed. I know you don't want to see me dance now. And again, it was true. Of course I do, I pleaded. I never asked you before because I never had to. In fact, I always had to beg you to stop. She got up and lifted her foot, ready to do a spin. Bahaya, she said, so I knew she was coming around. She never called me that unless she wanted something from me. It's so quiet and lonely here. I don't want to dance alone. I need company. You want me to dance with you? Uh, no way. Come on, Bahaya, don't you want to dance with your baby sister? I knew she was playing me, but I also knew she was truly sad, like me. I put my hands over my head, pointed my toes, and bent my knees. I kicked my leg out to the side like I had seen her do a million times and heard something come crashing down. It was mom's favorite pot, an antique she had bought from an old Indian lady who I'm sure was scamming her. It was something ladies spit into or peed into or something gross. I'd never understood antiques. I picked it up and looked it over but couldn't tell if any of the dents were new. Let's go to the backyard, Sarah. It's not too cold today. Yeah, and we can really let loose in the backyard. I'll teach you my best moves. But you know, you can't learn the really hard moves unless you're wearing a tutu. I gave her my best, you must be kidding. Look, listen, I'm willing to dance with you, but there's no way I'm wearing a tutu. <clears throat> Don't worry about it, Ahmed. I've gone all these months without a twirl. I can make it a few more, she said, and sat back down. I couldn't tell if she was playing me or not, but I noticed I went from Bahaya to Ahmet. I kept standing, waiting for her to give in and join me, but she didn't. Fine, hand me the tutu. I squeezed myself into a purple tutu with glitter at the ends, and she put a tiara on my head. At this point, what did it matter? We went to the backyard and she taught me to dance. We pirouetted, demi-pointed, and plied. I hammed it up for her and she was all giggles. It felt good. I was in the cold, tiara crooked on my head, 
balancing on one leg, other leg outstretched behind me, hands exaggerated into a frame over my head when I thought I saw a flash. And was that the sound of skateboard wheels? Okay, so at the end of chapter 25, what do you think happened? We heard, we heard about skateboard wheels and there was a flash. So make a prediction about what you think was happening at the